Good morning, everybody. We're in Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. And we're in the home stretch because uh, following the Last Supper with the disciples, things are going to happen very quickly uh, in terms of our Lord's uh, arrest and trial and then suffering and crucifixion. Uh, but we've got a, a, a few last moments here in the, the gospel where, where Jesus is still with his disciples and teaching them uh, you know, some very important last things before all, all this uh, takes place. So um, let's begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us around your word this morning and ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us as we study that word so that by it our strength or our faith might be strengthened in you and your son Jesus as our Savior and our love for one another grow. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We spent all of last time dealing with the words of institution uh, found in, in verses 22 to 25. And I just want to say a few things as a way of recapping that as, as we move into this uh, next section. So it says in verse 22, As they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And uh, we, we said last time that for 1,500 years in the history of the church, that when Christ says, this is my body, and when he says, this is my blood, uh, that he means what he says, that we are to take those words at face value. He really is offering his very body and blood. That understanding went unquestioned, undebated, with very few minor exceptions, for 1,500 years. And so, uh, given the, the, the plain meaning of the words, the solemn context of them, the one who's saying them, the Son of God, and, and then the fact that the Christian church always understood them that way. The burden has got to be on the other side to prove that the Christians for all those centuries were wrong. Then for us, you know, to, to make the case that it, it is what it, what it is. That it, Jesus means what he says. Uh, so, so that's very important. And we also said that Mark doesn't have to give us everything we, we talked about how when we hear the words of institution on Sunday, more words are said than the words we hear right here in the Gospel of Mark. Mark's original hearers could have filled in the missing words. Why? Yeah, because they were hearing those words probably every week already. Uh, for, from the earliest days, you, you, you already see in Acts 2, with those first 3,000 that are brought to faith in Christ and are baptized, that, that w w what is it that they immediately start doing as, as a church practice? They, in, in maybe the first way of referring to the Lord's Supper, they broke bread together. And that's sort of the New Testament's way of referring to the Lord's Supper. Uh, you also get Lord's Supper itself as a, as a name for the sacrament in 1 Corinthians. Uh, but, but Mark doesn't have to give them the, all the words of institution since they, they know them, but he does focus on this, doesn't he? He focuses on the blood of the covenant. And where do we say that came from? Where, where does that phrase show up? Passover. Not Passover, mm -hmm. th though we want to talk about the connection with Passover again. But that very phrase, blood of the covenant, 
shows up in a very significant place in the Old Testament, a place we've already been taken to on Holy Week. Hint, hint. Holy Week begins what day? Palm Sunday. What happens on Palm Sunday? The people shout. Right? And this was to fulfill... He comes in on, on a donkey and this was to fulfill the Scripture which said He comes humble riding on a donkey bringing salvation. That's in Zechariah 9. So, so go to Zechariah 9. And beginning in verse 9. So it says, uh, Zechariah 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant, there it is, I, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. And so it's as if we have all of this enacted over the course of Sunday through Thursday, but we've got to also include what's about to happen, his death on the cross and resurrection. He enters Jerusalem as a what? King. As a king. He comes in as a king. He comes claiming to be king. He comes to bring peace. And now he's going to rescue them from the waterless pit. Uh by means of the blood of His covenant, which He's now giving to them in this meal. Covenant. Well, what about blood and covenant? What does that remind us of in terms of Old Testament events? I call it a covering. Covering. Right. And, and, and it is. But, but think of Think of covenants made in the Old Testament involving blood. Circumcision. How did that work? All right, circumcision. It was a sign of the covenant, that's for sure. But it was a sign of a covenant that God made with Abraham that involved what? Remember how this worked? Sacrifice. Yeah, a sacrifice. Yes, of, of, of what? Well, okay, but, but remember, the, the, the son got replaced. Yeah. He ended up not having to kill Isaac. Instead, what was, what was offered in its in place? Oh, yeah. yeah, ram, yeah. Uh, but remember, even besides, that, that, that wasn't so much a covenant. A covenant was made with Abraham that involved an animal in the shedding of blood. Do you remember this? But the first one was the animal in the garden. That the God yeah, that's right. Killed. To, 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 to provide the covering of their sin. That's right. But in terms of the Old Testament speaking, using the word covenant itself, a covenant was made with Abraham in which um, an animal was, was cut in two. Okay, and divided. And so the two parties of the covenant are on either side of the, the cut animal and, and the blood is, is, on, is on, on Abraham. Uh, what, what's, what's going on in that ritual. Can you imagine what's what's being said? It's interesting, the Old Testament language is always cut a covenant. It might get translated from time to time as make a covenant, but, it, but the verb is always cut. Because a covenant literally involved cutting an animal. And, and now, now the blood is sprinkled on the parties to the covenant. What's the symbolism of that? You've got an agreement, a promise. Blood oath. It's, it's a blood kind of oath. And, and what's the implication of, of the blood part? And, and the killing of the, and the dividing of the animal in two? Don't be dead. Yeah. S something along that lines of, of basically, and if I violate this covenant, blood, 
may it be to me as it was to this animal that we just cut in two. Yeah, that, that's the significance of, of, of those covenants. And then, and then the sprinkled blood, the shared blood, it happened again at Sinai. Remember, the law was presented to the people after Moses received it at the top of Mount Sinai. And what do the people say? We will do all that you have commanded. And then, animal sacrifice and blood is sprinkled on, on the people to, to seal them as, as parties to the covenant. Now Jesus says, I'm saving you by the blood of by my blood. What, what, what's different about this as opposed to those Old Testament covenants, the one with Abraham, the one with the people of Israel, and Moses? He does it all. He does it all. You, you could say at, at Mount Sinai, we've got kind of a conditional agreement where we'll do it, we'll do it. Okay, if you say so. Uh, and now let this blood be assigned to you of what you promised. But now it's all on Jesus. He sheds the blood and then simply gives it to them. There's, there's, no, there's no conditional promise on their part to be made participants in the covenant. He just makes them such by giving them His blood freely. Uh, moreover, obviously, in the Old Testament, the blood came from... Yeah, animals in general. I mean, di different animals depending on the sacrifices. But in uh, n now, it's it's the blood of Jesus Himself. It's the, so it, it's the blood of one who can stand in for the one He's redeeming in a way the animals could not. You know, the, the blood of bulls and goats never atoned for sin all those years of the Old Testament, but only pointed ahead to the one who would atone for sins by being as the one, being as those for whom he was being a sacrifice for. You follow that? We've talked about that before. It came up with when Jesus is interacting with his opponents and they want to know by what authority he does the stuff he does. Right? And, and so, he well, well no, it's, it's even after that. Where, where he initiates the conversation by saying, tell me this, how can David say, my Lord, you know, the Lord said to my Lord? You know, how can this possibly be if the Christ is David's son? And he's getting at the fact he is David's son, but he's also in some way greater than David because he's also the son of God. He's both and must be both to save us. He, to, to be our substitute, he has to be a human being because that's who he's come to save. Um, okay. Uh, now, the, realizing that Jesus is talking about a covenant and blood, it takes us back to the, the whole sacrificial system, right? Um, we, I think, because the rules seem so arcane, and because Jesus has fulfilled all this, we, we, we just skip past Leviticus. Heck, we skip past Numbers, and probably skip past Deuteronomy. Not Rose. Rose reads... <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but Leviticus is so critical to our understanding of, of how Jesus saves us. How His body and blood... Uh, be, become the, the offering in sinner's place. So, um, th think of all those various kinds of sacrifices. Jesus doesn't just fulfill one of them, He fulfills all of them. We have this kind of simplistic view that, okay, the Old Testament operated with this principle, um, a person sins, Animal dies, sins atone for. And, and it, it's so much richer and fuller than that. So you had such a thing as, yes, a sin offering. And, and so many of these sin offerings, what you would have is, an animal would be sacrificed on the, the altar 
that stood outside the, the, the Holy of Holies itself. And, and the, the, the animal is, is killed you know, and, and, and uh, burned on the altar, but the, um, the priest was allowed to eat the meat, you see, of the sin offering. And th- there, there's a hint that what's going on is that the, the priest is serving as a sin eater. He, he's, literally, he's eating the sins of the people. They're, they're consuming them to make them go away. Just as we think of Jesus as the sin bearer, he takes our sins into himself and bears them away on the cross and in the tomb. Sin offering. But then there's also a whole burnt offering where there's nothing left to be eaten by the priest or anybody. The whole thing is burned up. And, and there, you, you've, you've got emphasis on the aroma of the burning animal. It, it's a pleasing aroma to God. And this accompanies the, the atoned for sinners' prayers. So we have an offering of access to God in the whole burnt offering. So Jesus likewise presents Himself to be slaughtered, to be killed, and enables access to God in a way that sinners did not have access before, couldn't have access. You also had in so many of these different offerings a rule about elevating the sacrifice, whether it was a grain sacrifice or even in some cases an animal, and the animal would be lifted up. The grain would be lifted up. What's going on there? The offering is is being presented to God. What happens to Jesus? He's lifted up on a cross. It's as if He's presenting His perfect human nature to God as a, as a suitable substitute for our sinful human nature, our corrupted human nature. And then finally, you have the fellowship offering. What happens in the fellowship offering? Sometimes called a peace offering. What's unique about the, the fellowship offerings? Everybody partakes. Everybody partakes. So the sinner brings a sacrifice, but then the, the animal sacrificed turns into a meal for the sinner and his family and, and, and those he brings to celebrate the fact that he has regained access to God's, uh, God's holy place. Um, the fellowship offering. So w- where is the, the, the fellowship offering for us Christians? The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a fellowship offering in which we are given the very one sacrifice so as to rejoice in the gift, and, and it, it brings us in, it incorporates us in. Um, we, we Lutherans are, are rightly um, critical of the Roman Catholic treatment of the Lord's Supper as a sacrifice in which the priest offers Jesus up again and again and again. You know, that's how they think of the Mass, as their uh, bloodless sacrifice in which they the priest offers Jesus up to atone for the sins of the congregation or the sins of someone who's died. You, know, you can pay the priest to do a mass for your departed loved one. And so what's the priest doing? You don't have to be there. right? But the priest, on his own, privately, is going to consecrate the elements and then, and then offer them up on behalf of the person that's already died. Uh, the mass is for the dead. And, and, and so we rightly say, no, no, no. The, the sacrament of the altar is not a sacrifice in that way. It's not a sacrifice. It's a sacrament where the fruits of what's already been sacrificed are now delivered to the people for whom the sacrifice was offered. You follow that? Just as it was. Passover is like this. The future generations that celebrated Passover... It was not just a, a meal to remember stuff and, and, and keep the memory of what God did alive uh, way back on when, when He brought death to the firstborn of Egypt. It was also incorporating those future generations into God's ongoing keeping of the promise, which began that first Passover, but continued on with the people that eventually ended up in the promised land. And so, likewise, 
Christ is sacrificed once for all. And yet we continually participate in that by being the beneficiaries of it and receiving the benefits of it, most especially when we meet Christ, His body and blood, in the Lord's Supper. Does that all... Any questions about... I mean, we, we could spend hours on this, on, on all the, the aspects and dimensions of the Lord's Supper and, and how they're uniquely or, or uh, remarkably anticipated by the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. But, but the Lord's Supper is not a sacrifice in that sense of, of, of Jesus offering Himself up again. Once for all, the Bible says. Sacrifice for sin once for all. But... We weren't there 2,000 years ago. And yet, we're, the, the past is brought forward into the present by means of this meal. Not only that, the future. We're, we're given a foretaste of the future. Because what does he say? I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. That in other words... Um, this festive eating and drinking won't take place again until that heavenly banquet in heaven, of which the Lord's Supper serves as a preview. So every time we come to the Lord's Supper, it's not just taking us back to when Jesus died on the cross for us, it's also taking us into the future when we'll sit at table again with Jesus face to face, just as the disciples did on Monday, Thursday. For now, He serves us. right In the Lord's Supper, He comes to us and serves us His body and blood. But then, He'll sit alongside us and, and eat and drink. So, th th that was one that, that uh, took, took me years to figure, what does it mean, won't drink again of the fruit of the vine? And then you, you start thinking about how when He's on the cross, and, and, and they present the gall or the vinegar, right? And so is he refusing that because it would mean breaking this promise? And see, it doesn't mean wine won't pass his lips ever again. But that he won't drink. I mean, drinking wine is something you do at, at, at a party, at a celebration. And I know we all think, oh, they, they must, that's all they drank back then was wine. You know, wine. No, no. They, they drank water for the most part. <laughs> they, they did. And, and you know, that, that's a Middle Ages kind of thing. Where, where the water is so dirty that, yeah, they, they drink wine instead. Um, but, no, no, drinking wine is, is, is a, a sign of, of celebration and joy and revelry and, 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 and that kind of drinking again won't happen until the, 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 the end, the resurrection. Okay? A any more questions about, about that? You know, in, in, in Leviticus, Leviticus tells us that you're not to eat blood, drink blood. Why? It's the life in the blood. The life is in the blood. So you don't you don't drink you don't drink the blood of another animal. The, the pagans did that. You know, the, the, the pagans thought that they could help their own vitality by absorbing, consuming the vitality of another creature. And, and God said, uh-uh, you don't do that. that. That's my life that I've given that creature. And when it dies, the life goes back where it belongs in the ground. But that wasn't the only reason you didn't drink the blood. What was the other reason? What was the blood for? Atonement. Atonement. Now all of a sudden, Jesus comes along and says, drink my blood. See why the Jews are so offended? And yet they missed it. They missed that this is the whole point. That His blood uniquely is to be drunk because it, it can impart life to the one that, that receives it. And it's for atonement. Okay. Um, moving on. Verse 26. Let's read uh, to verse 31. <coughs> and when they had sung a hymn... They went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. 
But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. We forget the others were ju just as boastful and uh, self-confident as Peter was. Okay. Uh, when they had sung a hymn, uh, th th this is uh, maybe an over-translation because uh, the word, yeah, whom nasontes, whom nasontes. Do you hear that? Him, yeah. nasontes. It's a verb participial verb that just that means to him. So it doesn't say sing a hymn, it means and having hymned H Y M uh, N E D. You know it's 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 a it, they make a verb out of the word hymn. Uh, and having hymned they went out into the Mount of the Olives. Yeah and he says to them Jesus does that. Oh, yeah. Um I want to be careful here, but boy, it would be wonderful if this were true for sure. Okay, So there, there's, there's a, a kind of a caveat that what I'm about to say may or may not be the case. Probability of it being the case, let's say, is probably in the 60 to 70 percent range. But that's still not good enough to go to the throne of judgment on, right? Um, a lot of people... How many of you have ever participated or witnessed a Seder meal? Okay, a lot of you have. Uh, and, and it's a custom, especially among American evangelical churches, Protestant churches, to spend somehow part of Maundy Thursday following this script that gives you, or supposed to give you, an idea of what that whole Passover Lord's, especially the Passover part of the celebration Jesus had with his disciples would have been like. Now the problem with those Seder meetings is that it's based on post-biblical material. Like, like the, the, the earliest complete Seder meal script we have comes from about a thousand. So this is over 900 years after the fact. Now, some aspects of it come from the 200s and 300s. So, so we're, we're closer to the original event. But, but here's the problem. Is that those, those celebrations of Passover that took place after this, the records that we have of them are from a time post-temple. When was the temple destroyed? 70 AD. 70 AD. A.D. 70. Judaism went through a massive rethinking after the temple was destroyed. And so a lot of their customs and rituals started from that date and, and, and don't necessarily reflect a continuity with a time period before the temple was destroyed. Moreover, many of the things Judaism undertook to, to do was a conscious reaction to what the Christians were doing, the Jewish Christians especially. And so they're conscious, consciously wording things so as to correct, reform the, the way the, the Christian Jews who have gone off the reservation were doing it. And so we've got to be, we, we think, oh, this, this, is, must, this must be what it was like that night. And no, we, we, we can't with that much confidence say those things. So we're left with just what the scripture gives us. So, you know, there are all kinds of things about the significance of the cup. You know, and, and you, you've got multiple cups in the celebration of a Passover meal. And so which cup was it that he blessed? Was it the second cup or the third cup, which, you know, each symbolizes a different thing. Uh, and, and it's so speculative as not to be of any value to us. Now, one of those elements that we know about from the earliest period, you know, this isn't 
from the, the, the Seder script from a year 1000, this is stuff from like the 200s. What was part of the way they celebrated Passover? They sang hymns before and hymns after. And we know what those hymns were. Okay? They sang the old rugged cross. And what a friend we... No, no, no. <laughs> As it's used in Greek. All right, so so you're still awake. That, that's so. Uh, that's so awake. If we were awake. Yeah, D D Jill was having trouble going to sleep last night, and so I just say, all right, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. <laughs> we'll be, and then you're. I like a lot. <laughs> so. She, she actually, she said, because I did it in a soporific voice, she couldn't go to sleep. She says, do it more like you, you do it in actual class. I go, we're at Mark 14! And, and then, then she was out like a lot. Yeah. Right, too much now, now it's just going to happen. I'm telling these people. Uh, but Psalm, go to Psalm 113. The Psalms that were sung in this, this period of the Jewish religion came from the so-called Hallel Psalms. And we've talked about this before. What are the Hallel Psalms? Why are they called Hallel? H-A-L-L-E-L. -L -E -L. Hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, which means? What does Hallelujah mean? Praise the Lord. Um, so these are known as the Hallel Psalms because just about all of them either start or end with those words. They have a hallelujah in them. Uh, 113, praise the Lord. There it is. Hallelujah. Uh, 116, right? Um, 115 ends, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, but if I remember right... Uh, Psalms 113 to 115 were sung before, at the beginning of the Passover celebration, and 116 to 118 uh, at the end. And, and 118 especially is kind of the jewel of the crown. Look, look, look at this. Uh, 118, oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say His steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say His steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but He has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. Save us? What is that? What's the Hebrew? Save us? Hosanna. 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 The very words they cried out when he entered Jerusalem. Right? So we've, we've begun Holy Week with Psalm 118. And, and, and now as we near the end of Holy Week, we've got Psalm 118 in the mind still. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. 
O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. This was a psalm that the, the Israelites likely prayed or, or sang in connection with remembering their deliverance in Egypt. Because it's connected in their practice with Passover. And even though there's, there's no prescription anywhere in the Bible that you, you say Psalm 118 when you celebrate the Passover, right? That, that this custom came in after Malachi was written, sometime, if, if, if it came in before the 200s. But which doesn't seem that implausible to, to imagine. But, then, but think about it, how God in no way ordered His people to be saying this psalm when they celebrated Passover. And so there was no divine mandate that the disciples should be singing it when they finished having their Last Supper with, with Jesus, and yet they were. This is what they were hymning when they left that upper room. And can you imagine providentially a better song to have going into Jesus' agony in Gethsemane. Because it's all about deliverance and salvation, and, and now Christ is going to fulfill this in a much greater way than, than the deliverance the Israelites experienced when they crossed the Red Sea. I shall not die, but I shall live. See? Jesus knows what's ahead of Him, but He also knows God's going to deliver Him. That there will be resurrection at the end of this. Uh, the Lord has disciplined me severely, but He's not given me over to death. He dies, and yet He's not given over to death. Death doesn't. The death releases its grip on Jesus. It has to. And and now these gates of righteousness. What are they? They're the gates of Jesus' death. You know, Jesus is going to walk through death to enter into this 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 new righteous place. Um, and, and, and now whenever we hear those words, this is the day the Lord has made, we should think of it as the, the, the day we've been living in ever since Jesus was, was raised. You know, the day the Lord has made is the, the day of the resurrection. We now live in the power of that victory over death. Uh, and, and all of this, the, the disciples were singing, uh, we, we might imagine, and had no idea, had no idea how right they were in singing those words. Um, so, Psalm 180. You'll, you'll notice these psalms, we don't know their origins. You know, so many of the psalms, they'll say a psalm of David, or a psalm of Asaph, uh, you know, various musicians that, that wrote some of the, a psalm of, a psalm of Moses, Psalm 90, but, but not these. These just, they're, they're just there. They're just part of the Psalter. Uh, who knows how, uh, you know, the, the background. Uh, we can't buy a... Uh, you know, you know, you have all these hymn books that, that will, will give you a little backstory on the authors and when the hymn was written. Don't, don't have anything on that on Psalms 113 to 118. Um, and and, and they, they make their way into this context. So, uh, pretty cool. Okay, so they went out to the Mount of Olives. Anybody been to the Holy Land? Anybody ever been to Israel? Dale, have you been to Gethsemane? Uh, not Yosemite. Oh, okay. No, no. Because it's still there. It's still there. Uh, Mount of Olives, you'll remember, is on the eastern side of the uh, of, of the, the Temple Mount. Uh, and, and Gethsemane, which we're coming up to, is is, is there. It's, a, it's an olive orchard. Um, but, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Gethsemane is in verse uh, 32, not, not, not here. Uh, but they go to the Mount of Olives. And now Jesus has this uh, foretelling of their, their abandoning Him. He says, You will all fall away, for it's written, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Where's that from? Anybody know? It, it, it's like there, there are three places that, that that nearly all of this stuff comes from Zechariah. In, in the suffering. Yes, yes, yeah, Zechariah nine. Yeah, yeah. So Zechariah nine, Isaiah. 40. No. 
53, suffering servant, right? Br bruised for our iniquities, right? Um, you know, like, like, like sheep, we've all gone astray. Yeah. Uh, and then Psalm 118, that's for sure. The one we just read, let's say four. There's one more Psalm that's really good, at, especially when we get to the cross, that we're going to see fulfilled over and over and over again. The one Tim chants on Monday, Thursday. Psalm 22. So, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That psalm. And so many of the details in that psalm we, we see fulfilled in Christ's suffering and death on the cross. Um, but this one is, is Zechariah 9 again. So, so go back to, um, well, Zechariah 13. Yeah. yeah. Remember we looked at Zechariah 9 to 14 and said how just about everything in here is going to get fulfilled in some way by the events of Holy Week. And so here, here's yet another one, uh, another passage from Zechariah that we know because Jesus himself says this uh, that night right before he was betrayed. So uh, Zechariah uh, 13. And, and let's look at verse 2. See, it says, On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more. And also I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. And if anyone again prophesies, his father and mother who bore him will say to him, You shall not live, for you speak lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who bore him shall pierce him through when he prophesies. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. He will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive, but he'll say, I'm no prophet, I'm a worker of the soil, for a man sold me in my youth. And if one asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He'll say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones, and the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I'll put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I'll answer them. I'll say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. So uh, the, the Lord is now bringing, in, in the original context, you know this is judgment. But the judgment is, is ultimately going to fall on the shepherd. I will strike the shepherd. He's going to bring sword... The, he's going to call his sword to, to act against the shepherd. And, and now Jesus is saying that's exactly what's about to happen. And what will also happen as a consequence, the sheep will be scattered. And, and who are the sheep in this case? The disciples themselves. They're, 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 they're going to get out of there as fast as they can. But then after I'm raised up, I'll go before you to Galilee. And not, not to uh, spoil it, he does rise again. <coughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, but, but notice in Mark 16, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll spend a, a little bit of time on this. On how, I think most of you have that note above verse 9 that says the, the earliest manuscripts don't have verses 9 to 20. And, and, and so a lot of, lot of debate kind of over... You know, could Mark possibly have ended his gospel this way on such a cliffhanger? And, and there, there are all kinds of good reasons for thinking, yes, yes he did. He, he had in, intended deliberately to end on this suspenseful note to kind of bring the reader, the hearer, into the story. Because the, the hearer of the story knows what happens. You know, kn knows that they, they, the women from the tomb did indeed tell the disciples, and the disciples did see the risen Christ. But, but look at this. Uh, verse 7. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you'll see him just as he told you. And so it's another one of these just as he told you's, and all the other just as he told you's have been fulfilled. So of course this one is too. We don't need 9 through 20 to know that he did meet them in Galilee. Um, and, and, and when did he tell them? He, he, he told them right, right before 
his praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Peter says to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Uh, we know, of course, that it, what Jesus says here comes true in this most shameful way, and we're, we're going to get the account of that in, in just a little bit. What's Peter's problem? What, what, what can we learn from, from Peter's mistake here? Where's his confidence? In himself. In himself. He, he, he's drawing strength from himself. And, and, and Jesus says, uh-uh, what's about to happen is going to overwhelm you. If, if, if you're to survive this, you need to draw from my strength. Your confidence needs to be somewhere else. It needs to be in me. And, and we're going to see that play out in the garden. And then, of course, we'll see it play out in the actual denial. Uh, interesting note, we said that Mark, Mark, you know, the, 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 the author of this gospel, wasn't one of the twelve. Uh, neither was Luke, for that matter. Matthew and John were, were of the twelve, but, but not, not Mark and not Peter. I mean, not, uh, not Luke. Who, who then did Mark get so much of this information from? What, what, what's, what's that early tradition? We talked about this going back to 2017 when we first started this series. Um, do, do any of you remember that? Peter. Peter, that, that Mark traveled with Peter toward the end, and uh, one of, like, like um, you know, next generation Christian writes that Mark collected what Peter preached and, and arranged it into what we now have as his gospel. Luke, meanwhile, he traveled with Paul. And, and, and so Luke's gospel in, in the book of Acts received the Apostle Paul's imprimatur. Um, but um, Mark, we, we can assume, or, or should assume, is, is giving us stuff Peter uniquely knew, or knew intimately well. And, and so one of the places that comes out here is that um, the, the other Gospels don't have before the rooster crows twice. That twice bit is only in Mark's. And of course, Peter would remember it better than anybody else, Right? Um, so the rooster crows uh, before, before the rooster crows twice you will deny me three times uh, but he said emphatically if I must die with you I will not I mean if I must die with you I will not deny you and they all said the same uh, how wrong they were okay so we move on to Gethsemane alright and again so, so no one's been to Gethsemane I mean, I just think it's the coolest thing. It's still there. You know, you can actually visit it. And that if it weren't for the tourists, it, it's a very peaceful place. But of course, if you go there and complain about that, you're, you're part of the problem. <laughs> but, uh, and they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Okay. Um, this olive grove, this Gethsemane garden, uh, I think we can rightly assume was a place frequented by Jesus. 
that they seem to know this place. They, they've been here before. Um, but, but here's something interesting. Who does he take with him? Only those three, Peter and James and John, when, on what other occasions has Jesus taken with him only Peter, James, and John? <laughs> Mount of Transfiguration? Very good. But there's one other in the Gospel of Mark. Yeah, the raising of Jairus' daughter. Which, in the Gospel of Mark, is the only resurrection account. That, that, that's the only raising that Mark gives us. Right, you've got the widow at Nain in, um, I think Matthew and Luke, but but not in Mark. Not and, and raising of Lazarus is in John. Raising of Jairus's daughter is the one raising in his gospel. So the only foreshadowing of his own resurrection. So Peter and James and John alone get to see that. Peter, James, and John alone get to go up the Mount of Transfiguration and see Jesus reveal himself as the Son of God. And, and what, what are they told by Jesus as they come back down? Don't tell anybody until after he's raised from the dead. Right. Now, where are they with Jesus? Gethsemane, and what are they witnessing? What are they privileged to, to behold? Yeah. It's as if and they, they saw his power in raising Jairus' daughter. They saw his glory, his majesty on the Mount of Transfiguration. But now they're going to see his agony. And it, 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 it's, a, it's a reversal. It's, it's the complete opposite of what they've seen before. You know, it's enough to cause cognitive dissonance. Wait a minute. I thought this was the radiant Son of God that, that God the Father said, listen to him. Yes, he did. <laughs> and yes, he is. And yet, he's also about to bear the sins of the world. And so he's now in great agony. Pastor, yes. Um, what's in it? Luke that told the yeah, description sweating blood. of the great drops of blood. People right. said, how can, you, how can you sweat blood? Actually, the blood vessels break. Right. And they mingle with the sweat. Yeah, and, and we do know... Yeah, it's interesting. Rose is bringing up Luke's description of him... Could we turn there? This always, I don't know why, why pastors feel the need to um, go, go, go medical on us. But that's a physical part of his suffering. Yeah, yeah. Look, look, look at Luke verse, uh, this is Luke 22 verse 44. And, and apparently, uh, there, there have been known cases of people in extreme physical distress who in fact did sweat blood, have sweat blood. Now, here, here's, here's uh, the, the, the problem I have with, with having to go there. It doesn't say he sweat blood. <laughs> it says as if. As if, yeah. But see, I, I, I will hear <laughs> pastors elide that and say he sweat blood. No, no it says he, it, he, his sweat became like became like great drops of blood. Not, not that it actually was blood, but anyway. Uh, but but it, it's certainly a sign of the tremendous distress he is in. And, and, and just w w want to be careful here that yes, it's... Oh, yeah, yeah, Maria. Why couldn't it be also a sign of the blood in the water? Oh, right, yes, John, John's going to point that out when he's pierced, that the blood and water flow out, the very means by which the church is created. Yeah, 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 I always like that. Because you, you think about, Paul in Ephesians tells us that marriage, which instituted in Genesis chapter 2, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Okay? Um... G, it, but, but, and, and he says this refers to Christ and the church. How so? What did Christ on the cross do? He gave Mary, his mother, to John. He left his mother. He left his mother. Okay? Um, and then, out of his side, out of his side, where did Eve come from? 
Adam's side, blood and water come out, blood of the sacrament, the water of baptism, the means of grace that create the church, Christ's bride. And he now cleaves to his wife, us, the church. It does refer to Christ and the church. It's right there. Yeah. What was Adam before the fall into sin, his occupation? Yeah. Tiller of the soil. Yeah, but he had he had something better than a soil. Caretaker of what do we call Eden? The garden. The garden. What did Mary Magdalene mistake Jesus for? Yeah, he is. She was right. He's the new Adam, who is a gardener. So so is Jesus. Get it? I mean, isn't that? And it's 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 a tomb in a garden. They're in a garden. So we're back in a garden with a gardener. Paradise restored. Yeah. Um, okay. But that's all in John. This is this is Mark class. We got we got to deal with what Mark says. Uh, but so Peter, James, and John, they they're gonna see this other extreme of who Jesus is as they watch him pray in agony about the hour passing, the cup being taken away. Um, and I, I I know it's conventional to, to say, ah, oh, here we're seeing G this is Jesus' human nature. This is his humanity being put on display. And and and, and yes, to, to, to see him in agony like this, that is definitely a human characteristic. And yet, let's be very careful because it, it's, it's not simply Jesus being afraid to die. You know, a lot of, I, I mentioned John Huss singing as he's burned at the stake. You know, a lot of Christian martyrs, a lot of non-Christian martyrs, have gone to their martyrdom without sweating as, you know, sweating sweat that became like drops of blood. You see, because his, what, what Christ is about to undergo is unlike anything any other human being has ever undergone. He's about to bear, and, and the clue here is, is cup. Take this cup from me. Throughout the Old Testament, cup, to, to, to make your enemies drink of the cup down to the dregs, is to drink judgment to bear judgment, to be punished, to be destroyed. He's about to bear the cup of God's wrath against sin. That's what's weighing Jesus down in the garden. You know, no one else has had to endure that. He's feeling the, the weight of all of the world's sin on Himself and, and the consequences of that sin. God's anger and ultimately God's turning His back on Him, which we'll see happen on the cross. He knows that's about to happen. And so it's interesting, he says, um, that, it, that if it were possible, this hour might pass from him. And it's interesting that the Greek can go two different ways. You, you, you could say, you know, he wants this hour not to come. Or, or another way of translating it is, he wishes this hour was already come and gone. And, and, and that, that might be a better way of understanding. You know, it's not like he's trying to get out of it so much as he, 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 he just wants to get, get through it. Uh, but, but we've got more to talk about, especially him addressing the Father as Abba. And, and uh, part of our new relationship through Christ toward God is to be able to call him Abba and what, 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 what that entails. And then the, the, the demonstration he's given us giving us in the garden of what it means to pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done. Can I ask you, on yeah. all of these, both these and the, the passage with the temptations of Jesus, yeah. something that for me, I want to say bothers me, is that they were asleep, how do they know? You know, they were like reading the account of what they observed, oh. and then they're like, oh, we're asleep, and this is what he said, I'm like, how do you know? Right. <laughs> oh, the, yeah. That, that's that's very good. You know, it's like I just, well, remember he spent he spent forty days with them at, after he rose before he ascended, and so may, maybe there's that. And then there's also the idea that he, he's not just saying it once. And and so at what point did they nod off? Yeah. Right. That that that, that, that 
you know, he wakes them up, he goes back to praying, they hear, you know, it was like Jill getting just, you know, the first two lines of the Mark study last night, right? You know, I kept going for an hour, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I thought about that too. And, and I think it, it's that. It's not like they, 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 they fell asleep immediately. Uh, they, they, they heard, and that was what he continued to pray along that theme of take this cup from me, uh, not my will, but thy will be done, and, and so forth. So it, it, it is interesting what, what they only give you those words once, right? And, and then they just say, you know, second and third time, he, he went back to pray and he came back and we were asleep. Okay. You know, if, if this is Peter's, if he's the source for this, yeah, some, something like that. Um, wait, did we miss? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's coming up. The, the, the guy, the young man who, who runs away naked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> well, it, it's just such an interesting little. Who is this guy? And uh, so, okay, He's streaker. Yeah, the streaker. Yeah, yeah. It, it's Ray Stevens. Is that too old a reference? Was it Ray? Didn't he sing the streak? Yeah. Ray Stevens. Yeah. Okay. He's still around. Yeah, he's still around. Okay. Uh, and is he? Okay. But there's, there's nothing. It's like, is that a reference that no one, no one knows? Ray Stevens. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Let, let's close in prayer. Yeah. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the time you've given us in your Word, and we pray that as we continue to study these last uh, chapters of Mark and read the familiar account of our Lord going to the cross for us that uh, we might hear these words anew and draw greater strength for our faith from them uh, so that we may cherish all the more uh, the gifts won for us by His atoning death. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.